blockchain will become mainstream in the next couple of years and people will actually start to use it, whether they know it or not. Welcome to the Payroll Podcast with your host, Nick Day of JGA Recruitment, specialist payroll recruiters. As soon as the mainstream starts to trust cryptocurrency, I think it's very feasible. We are getting paid in that cryptocurrency, provided it's not so volatile and provided everyone else accepts it. Hello and welcome to the Payroll Podcast. Today, I am delighted to be joined by Anita Letting, SVP of Strategy and Alliances at MGA HR. And she is responsible for strategy and alliances globally. She has held a number of key senior positions working with NGAHR clients, and she is now responsible for defining the global strategy of the NGAHR business, which of course are one of the UK's leading payroll and HR solution providers. Previously, Anita was NGAHR's VP for Northern Europe and Managing Director for the Netherlands. Recently, I've been fascinated by some of the articles Anita's been writing in relation to blockchain technology and its potential impact on the payroll and HR industries. Blockchain is a huge buzzword out there in the market. And today I want to demystify blockchain and cryptocurrencies to find out how they may impact the payroll departments of tomorrow. Now, blockchain is still highly experimental technology. I want to find out if the technology is advanced enough for any software provider to be able to recommend it. NGA Human Resources employ over 5,000 staff across 35 countries. And Anita, who has been writing a number of articles on the subject, is the perfect expert to have on the Peril podcast to talk to us about blockchain and its technology in a little bit more detail. So welcome, Anita. How are you? Hi, Nick. Thank you for inviting me to the podcast. I'm delighted to be here to be able to speak to your uh, audience and to explore the potential application of blockchain and payroll with you. Fantastic. It's a subject that not many people know much about either. So I think not only can we talk about how it might be used in payroll, but also perhaps demystify what it actually is and get people to understand the technology behind blockchain as well. But before we do that, I would like to kick off just a little bit, basically just to find out a little bit more about yourself, Anita, if we can. So five quick questions. I know you started initially at Arinzo International in 2001 and you've been with the business ever since. Tell us a little bit more about your journey from senior business consultant uh, to becoming SVP of Strategy and Alliances in 2017. Happy to do so. So when I joined in 2001, as you just mentioned, when you look at HR and payroll, it was completely focused on ERP. The first applications had been installed at clients and we were thinking about how to best use it. And also, if you remember well, shortly before that, Dave Ulrich had written his book about application of shared service centers. So that was a big part of my job, thinking about how clients could use technology, how they could reorganize their HR departments so that delivery to employees was as effective and as efficient as it could be. And Throughout the years, HR has been on a journey to engage employees, to make the employee experience a lot better. And with the opportunities that came with the cloud, you can really bring HR to people who matter most, of course, because it's people who ultimately, you know, create your business, who run your business. So to ensure that these people are equipped and that they get paid on time, that they get trained well. You have to exploit these new technologies so that it's incredibly important that they use this technology, that they use the learnings that you give them or that you make available to them, how they can bring HR and payroll best to their employees, to share that with them. That's been a big part of my focus. Sure, sure. I know that a lot of your focus is, of course, discussing and uh, predicting, I guess, the future of the payroll industry. And I, I was quite interesting to see an article you wrote back in 2016 about there being an increase in businesses migrating their payrolls to the cloud. Back in 2016, it was still relatively new, but it appears your predictions were correct. So kudos to you. You said the biggest barrier to making those changes, though, would be fear. So fast forward to 2018. How do you see the future of payroll changing now, perhaps both in the short and the longer terms? And do you still view fear as being the biggest barrier for these changes taking place? So I'm going to 
say something about fear. I think what I really said was the biggest barrier was risk. Consider a payroll owner in a company and everything runs smooth the way it is. Then you really don't want to anything to jeopardize a very stable payroll environment. I think that is still the case because in itself, there is no financial business case for migrating a, a payroll that runs smooth from on-prem to the cloud. There has to be more than that. And I think what you see right now is that in the enterprise segment, which is of course a big focus for, uh, for NGA, you see that that is, that that continues to be the case. So if you have 50,000 employees on a payroll and everything runs smooth, unless there is something big happening in your company, think mergers, acquisitions, that type of events, you want to keep everything as stable as you can. While at the same time, what we see the enterprise segment move to cloud for the interface with the employee, which is the HRIS, right? So core HR, talent applications. Interestingly enough, where we see a lot of movement in payroll to the cloud is the mid-market segment. Okay. Because when they move, for them, it's critical to keep everything together. And um, so when they move, they move core HR and payroll. And we're actually involved in a lot of those payroll migrations at the moment. Quite well, interesting. So what typically might be some other reasons for a business looking to make a change? What we do see is that, especially when it comes to uh, multi-country businesses, at a certain point, they simply do not want all these local systems anymore. And so when they move to the cloud, they do have a business case because they're moving away from, let's say, 25 or 30 different payroll systems to one payroll provider. And that is usually a you know hosted payroll in the cloud in some shape or form. Sure. That is an important driver. Obviously, the event that takes place is usually the move to a single cloud core HR system where suddenly people realize that if they move to the cloud, they have to start establishing interfaces to all these different systems that are in country. It's not only payroll, but it's also time and sometimes other HR related systems. And that is the moment that they decide to move everything to the cloud. Fine. That makes a lot more sense. And obviously, an age of globalization, I guess it's a, it's a busy time for suppliers like yourselves with companies looking for risk-averse solutions that can deliver you know, a full solution to multiple countries. It's interesting. And that kind of leads us nicely then into what we really want to get into, which is blockchain and, and how blockchain technology can assist potentially or get involved with HR and payroll technology. Before we talk about what blockchain, which is also known for the listeners out there as distributed ledger technology or DLT, can you just clarify for the listeners what blockchain or DLT is? Yes, absolutely. And I'm going to keep it a little bit high level instead of bursting out in a full technology uh, overview. So on high level, really what you do is you create a secure ledger of all the transactions and you copy that ledger on a decentralized infrastructure. And so what happens then if someone makes a transaction that is added to the ledger, the ledger is changed and that change is then broadcasted to all the parties that participate in that network and they validate it and approve it. Once that transaction is complete, it's added to a block. And then once the block is full, it's added to an existing chain of blocks. And that's why we call it blockchain. Great. And it's also encrypted, which is very important because that means that the blocks can be changed or tempered with. And that obviously is a big advantage of the blockchain or the DLT infrastructure. Sure. A very good way of describing it, to be fair, is a very easy to follow description, which is fantastic. So now we know a little bit more about what blockchain is in simple terms. How do you think it's going to impact or change payroll? So what I think with blockchain and payroll is that it's not so much payroll itself that's going to be changed, but it's the way we provide data to payroll and the way that we get data out of payroll that will be mostly feeling the changes of blockchain. The reason why I say that is because, as you know, 
when you set up a payroll, you obviously use PII, right? Personal Ident- Identifiable Agent. And as we all know, that's a big thing this year because of the GDPR and people are, you know, rightfully worried about who has access to their data and who hasn't. So I think there is a drive from people to own their personal data and to understand what happens with that. At the same time, you also see that blockchain application is becoming very strong in what we call the fintech industry. So it's financial technology and that banks are looking, they're looking at blockchain to secure transactions and also to establish that when transactions happen, they are encrypted, they're secure, and everyone understands and trusts that they have happened, right? Because trust is key in this whole blockchain development. So summarizing, I don't think it will change payroll, you know, running payroll. I don't think it will change running payroll that much, but I do think it will have a fundamental effect on payroll processes, pre-payroll and post-payroll. Okay. So what do you see then, I mean, you mentioned you've touched upon it already, but what do you see as being the main benefits of blockchain? And are there any reasons why businesses should also be cautious uh, in terms of a risk perspective about implementing this type of technology? If you look at benefits of blockchain, it's early days yet. So we're slowly starting to understand how to use blockchain, what the advantages are. We're also starting to understand what some of the disadvantages are, right? And as this technology progresses, what you will see and what is currently happening is that there are different versions that start to emerge. And we'll talk a little bit about that later, but think about permissioned blockchains that are used in companies versus permissionless blockchains that are used by cryptocurrencies. So you already see two variations of blockchain that are being developed for different purposes. And so that is what is going to happen. That also means that we still are watching and piloting and creating use cases for how blockchain can be applied within the HR and payroll industry. And I think it's good to be cautious because there's a lot of hype around blockchain, especially around cryptocurrencies and bitcoins. And there's also a concern about energy consumption, which is mostly around the permissionless blockchains, but it's not to think about. Interestingly, Wired, the magazine, wrote a very interesting article that I also link into one of my blog posts around the usage of blockchain and all the hype surrounding it. So if you really want to dig a little bit deeper into hype, I suggest you read that article because it's, it's informative and it's also funny. Well, I've got a good hype example as well for those that are uh, the listening we've got. So blockchain, as we mentioned, it's, it's become a bit of an investor's buzzword, right? So it's hot, as you mentioned, I think your words were, it's hard to separate kind of the hype from the reality. But I don't know if you've heard of the Long Island Ice Tea Company, but on December 2017, so quite recently, this may well be in the Wired article, I haven't read it, but they're a New York's drinks brand and they actually changed their name, their company name to Long Blockchain Company. The company's stock rose by 289% on the back of the announcement. And that's despite the fact it had absolutely no blockchain-based products to sell and no concrete plans to develop any blockchain technology whatsoever. The change of direction actually failed because Nasdaq told them to remove them from the exchange and from misleading investors. But it just gives a great example of how easy it is to convince investors that they were worth investing in just based on them adding the word blockchain to their company name. So obviously, it's foolish to ignore blockchain, the impact it can have, but actually there's a huge amount of hype and sort of separating the two and people jumping on the bandwagon of Bitcoin, cryptocurrency or blockchain is is everywhere, which is why it's so great to have you on this podcast, Anita, because you've got a really good knowledge. And for those that aren't familiar with Anita writing, she's released a a series of four articles in total at the start of back in May, all about blockchain, how it's going to affect HR and payroll. And I will put some links to those articles in the episode notes for those that want to find out a little bit more. I've got one final question here, and we're recording this Pearl podcast in the middle of what is summer 2018. It's 10 years after Satoshi Nakamoto proposed the first blockchain. 
And yet we're still not really seeing many serious developments being made to integrate blockchain-based payroll technology into current systems. So we're also not really seeing businesses move entire payrolls away from user-controlled databases into blockchain systems. You mentioned it's sort of relatively new technology, but then Nakamoto developed it sort of 10 years ago. So why do you think this is and why do you think it's taken so long to get it to where it is at the moment? It's a really good question, Nick. And I think what has happened is that the focus on cryptocurrencies has not done the technology any favor, especially not when it comes to these initial coin offerings, right? So there's also a lot of mistrust around this technology. For instance, just last week, Bloomberg said that over half of these initial coin offerings die within four months after the tokens are sold. So people lose a lot of money. Yeah. And the other thing I think was that you remember the saying that privacy is dead was a reality for a long time. But in the past year or so, these enormous data breaches are teaching people that security matters and that you do want to encrypt your data so that no one can access it without your permission because you don't know where it ends up and what people do with it. So I think there are a number of events and trends converging to make this technology more interesting. There are already developments in fintech that have gone mainstream that are out in the public for everyone to use. For instance, in the area of international payments, where a Spanish bank has introduced an app where everyone can wire money home and it will arrive the next day against a fraction of the fee that you paid in the past for an international money transaction. There are also, for instance, shipping companies that use DLTs to make sure that what goes in the containers comes out of the containers at the endpoint and a blockchain ensures that the shipping lists are absolutely secure. So I think when you look at DLT, companies are starting to use it. It's maybe more in the B2B, so the business to business than in the business to consumer area right now. And I strongly believe that it will become mainstream in the next couple of years and people will actually start to use it, whether they know it or not. Sure. And actually, for those listening, um, I haven't seen it yet in the, in the recruitment market space for payroll, but uh, I know in my research that there are a number of blockchain based payroll companies which have already launched in the past two years. But a lot of those have been raising their sort of seed capital through using ICOs, which are initial coin offerings. So still sort of using cryptocurrency based funding methods to get their ventures off the ground. And uh, which I think is quite interesting, as you said, a lot of those uh, sort of disappear quite quickly as well. And we haven't quite seen it enter the mainstream yet. But I also saw an article from KPMG, who have just advised on the £5 million launch of Etch, which is a Dublin based service, which this is their claim. They claim it to be, uh, in quotations, the first innovation in payroll since the Industrial Revolution. And they're employing the Ethereum blockchain to allow employers to pay workers in in real time. You know, the big businesses out there, the NGAs of this world, the KPMGs, you know, I can see that a lot of the bigger companies are certainly looking into the technology. So um, it's interesting that you think yourself it might take another sort of couple of years until we see it, but it is probably going to come in. Yeah, I also think that before you might see it in uh, payroll, there's other areas in HR where the use cases are already brought to market. For instance, a number of educational institutes all around the world are now publishing certificates and diplomas on blockchains. So that might be a use of blockchain or DLTs that regular people like you and I will experience far before we will see anything in the financials. Sure. Fantastic. And we're going to go into blockchain in a little bit more I get a deeper dive into the detail um, after you find out a little bit more about yourself, Anita. So, Time to find out more about you. Firstly, a little bit more about you. How would your friends describe you and how would your work colleagues describe you? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think my friends will tell you that I love to spoil them with dinners that I cook. And my colleagues will tell you that I always try to find out what's going on in the world around us and how we can apply that to better serve our clients because I constantly evaluate our services. Even if it's good enough today, will it still be good enough tomorrow? Do you apply that uh, to your cooking as well? Evaluate and improve? (laughs) Yes, I can tell you that I never cook the same thing twice. (laughs) Interesting. So tell me something then about you that perhaps other people won't know about you. 
I play violin. Ah, okay. Yeah. Regularly? Is this uh, in an orchestra or uh, for fun? It's for fun. I have played in orchestras. Sometimes I do that again, but with all the traveling that I do now, that's really difficult to keep up. So at the moment, it's just for me and for fun. Slowly but surely, and completely unbeknownst to me before uh, embarking on this pair of podcasts, it seems that nearly everyone I've interviewed plays some kind of classical instrument. I'm thinking by the end of it, we could form your own orchestra. We had the last one I did was play the trumpets. We've had someone who plays the banjo, yourself on the violin. I can play percussion. It's amazing. Everyone seems to have these musical talents behind the scenes in payroll. So slightly different kind of uh, question. You're abducted by aliens who want to learn more about our species. What item would you take with you? That was a great question, and I've given it some careful thought, but I think I would bring an iPad. It's such a great window to the world that we live in because I could have these aliens listen to music, we could explore technology, show them pictures, read books, take a class. So it's such a great window into the world that we live in. Fantastic answer. I completely get it as well. I guess you can show many, many items through the one single portal, which essentially is what it would be, I guess. Fantastic. What game or instrument would you teach them? I would take Monopoly with me. Monopoly? Okay. Why Monopoly? Because it's just a fun game and I like to play it. So why not have a little bit of fun with the aliens? Do you play the London version? I actually have a Dutch version, which is the Rotterdam Monopoly version. Okay, nice. What would you tell them about humans? I would tell them that when you least expect it, they will always rise up and surprise you. Fantastic. And last question, what truth or human trait would you hold back? I would probably not introduce them to Twitter or any of those social media (laughs) apps because sometimes they're used for good, but they're also times that they bring out the worst in people. Yeah, I'd agree with that. And lots of uh, social noise and fake news. And uh, maybe it would give them a true reflection of what we're really about. But there's a lot of uh, misdirection in social media. So I like that. Fabulous. Well, listen, what we're going to do, we're going to move into some, uh, I guess, deeper dive questions. Five technical questions. I've got a few um I think challenging questions for you because, you know, as a layman on this side who's done my research, speaking to one of the leading payroll supplier, global payroll suppliers, it gives me an opportunity to hopefully ask some more challenging questions about blockchain, about the technology and how it can be used in, in a payroll capacity. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is, and you brought this up already in the podcast, is blockchain security. Blockchain security and risk in relation to its use within payroll related applications. And you mentioned GDPR already. That's also recently come into effect in May. So it's more important than ever that data is protected. From a data owner perspective, the problem of protecting personal data can be threefold. There's often a lack of ownership because once it's been entered, a third party can own the personal data. There's a lack of transparency because users can't audit what happens with their personal data. And of course, there's a risk of security breaches, which you've already mentioned, when databases that hold personal data can be a single point of failure. So with this in mind, how can blockchain help to keep personal data safe from a data controller perspective? It's a very good question. Now, what I would like to bring forward is that in principle, an employer cannot use employee data unlimited, right? Also not before the GDPR. You give an employer your personal data and they need to promise you to keep it safe and not to sell to third parties, for instance. So there is some trust that you have in this relationship, and hopefully you trust your employer to do the right thing uh, here. And also when they outsource this service to a third party, like NGA, for instance, there's legislation in place on what we can and what we cannot do with that personal data, and it's quite restrictive. So... You know, you also have to remember that you have to give an employer access to personal data because they need to pay taxes and social security on behalf of you. So it's unavoidable that they, for instance, disclose your name to the authorities as a statement that they have paid your taxes, right? So when you look at the gig economy, for instance, all that responsibility flips to the worker, right? Because in the gig economy, The employer pays a nominal amount to the worker 
who is then responsible for paying their taxes and social security. So there's already some of that responsibility moves away and that means that less of personal data resides with I'm going to call it the employer, but it's not really an employer in the in gig economy. So ultimately, I think there's always going to be a level of trust needed between employers and employees that personal data is being handled, you know, in the right way. Now, having said that, you can also see where an employer would allow an employee to protect some of their data because some of it has to be disclosed, but some of the data could be protected by introducing blockchain or a DLT. And that would mean that the employee would have a better picture of who uses that data and when. Because remember the example that I gave about recruitment, you could, for instance, if you apply for a job, decide you give access to some of your resume, but not all of it until you go into, you know, in, in a short list and have a conversation. So in the same way, you could also have your personal data protected, have your employer ask for permission to use it in a specific circumstance. Sure. For those listening, it's key for them to know as well that there are two major strands for how blockchain systems can affect recruitment as well. I mean, there's, as you mentioned, you can have private blockchains and permissioned but you can also have public and open. Right. Most people at the moment, the buzzword everyone talks about is Bitcoin. Everyone's heard of Bitcoin. The second biggest is Ethereum. They're the two main blockchains, and they are examples of two permissionless blockchains. So that is, they are public, they're not password protected, which I know has been a major barrier, for example, for many of the banks in adopting the technology. And I would argue that you know most companies wouldn't be happy for all of their transactions to be publicly made available to anyone who wants to view them. So that is something that currently is possible on the Ethereum blockchain network. Now, I know, you, as we mentioned a moment ago, you can create private permissioned blockchains. But my understanding, if I'm correct, and do correct me if I'm wrong here, Anita, is that ultimately they have one major flaw, which is if only a handful of people are allowed to update and validate transactions on what is a private blockchain, then they become single points of control and therefore potential single points of failure. So this could make them an easy target for hackers. Perhaps they could gain control of the entire blockchain by attacking only a small number of computers. So in terms of risk, security, and I guess transparency, do you think it will help make blockchain technology prohibitive in terms of businesses taking advantage of blockchain applications or not? I think it's all about trust and what level of trust you feel comfortable with comparable to banks, right? You store your money with a bank that you trust or you hope they do the right thing with your money and that you don't lose it. Also keep in mind that blockchain is encrypted, whether it's permissionless or permissioned. So even if you have access to the blockchain, it does not mean right away that you have access to the data that is stored in the blockchains. That's a great point, great point. But let's talk a little bit about permissionless versus permission blockchain or private blockchain, because that is important. It's also important to understand the difference. Most of these cryptocurrencies are permissionless blockchains, and it means that they allow anyone, you and me, to create an address and to start interacting with the network. So we can run a node and we can participate in the verifications of the transactions And that also means that in a cryptocurrency, we compete for payment because the one that verifies the block and that all the other parties trust gets a little bit of cryptocurrency, you know, as a thank you for creating the block. So that is also why these are so popular. You can actually earn money by joining a permissionless blockchain. Now, when you look at a permissioned blockchain, that's a closed ecosystem. And usually it's created by a consortium of companies who need to do business with each other or for some other reason are in business. And the purpose of those blockchains is to create a way to efficiently exchange information and record transactions. And so for enterprises, This 
can be a way to instill trust, transparency. For instance, the Hyperledger Foundation is an example of an open source initiative for these types of blockchains. With these types of blockchains, you can see where enterprises, but also people like you and I can make a choice on who is running that network. We're in a permissionless blockchain. We have no idea who is running the network because anyone can join, right? So a permission blockchain in that sense, once you have verified the parties that are participating in that network, can augment the level of trust so that people like you and I know it's secure and can have the confidence that these businesses operate the blockchain in a smart and effective way. Sure. No, that's a, it's a really good way of describing it. Right. And so I think especially when we're talking about trust, permissioned models will probably be a better fit. No, that makes sense. I think you described that really well. It doesn't necessarily take away the potential for there being a single point of failure, but the reality is you only enter in with an understanding of the risks before you join, right? So you establish that trust, you recognize, yes, there's a risk like there is in anything, and you decide to go ahead based on the fact that you trust the parties involved. I think you've described that really, really well. And there are a couple of risks. Well, apologies for throwing risks at you here, but I want to get everyone to really understand what blockchain is and blockchain is and how it can really impact and affect payroll on HR services. And I believe a risk within blockchain technology at the moment is in order for it to function as it was intended, the code behind a smart contract needs to be free from bugs. Now, I'm not a software expert at all, but if blockchain technology was being used to make a payroll payment, for example, a bug might allow the receiver of a payroll payment using a smart contract to request that payment multiple times and maybe get away with repeat payments before the blockchain system has a chance to update itself. Now, I know, of course, all software, including professional enterprise level software will contain bugs, but smart contract payments are irreversible with blockchain. So if this happened in relation to a payroll payment, there would be absolutely no chance for a company or a payroll manager to get that money back if a bug like that existed and was exploited. There is an example of such exploitation taking place as well. So in 2017, nearly $55 million worth of ETH or Ethereum was stolen because of an exploitable bug in Ethereum source code. It became one of the biggest backdoors in hacking history. And it came down quite simply to the capital T in line 666 of the code. Had that been a small team, it would have completely prevented the hack. It's quite unbelievable that such a small thing can result in a 55 million pounds worth of stolen crypto. But I'm making the point because in publicly released code, even Microsoft say they have about 10 to 20 bugs per thousand lines, and, and they confirm that only a very tiny proportion of code is ever technically perfect. So do you think in terms of utilizing blockchain, which I'm going with this, for processing payroll payments, that it'll make it too difficult for it to be developed as an effective and risk-free payroll solution? Now, I know that you said blockchain is going to be used in other areas that impact payroll as opposed to payroll processing itself in the main. But from a payroll solution perspective, do you think that code perfection level will make it too difficult for payroll software to be developed on a mass scale? No, I don't think so. And yeah, I did say that I believe that the first application will be in pre and post payroll, but I do also believe that you can create a payroll that runs on blockchain. And you're absolutely correct. There is no software that has no bugs. Yet we trust software to run our energy infrastructure, to run our ATM machines, to run, you know, everything that we rely on in our lives. We trust it to record this podcast. We trust it to run the internet and bugs happen, but they're usually not in the multitude of the example that you just gave. Sure. A very fair point as well. Yeah. So could it happen? Absolutely, because no software is bug free, but it could also happen today with, you know, with the current payroll and payment software that we are using. And you very rarely hear something about it with the smart contract. The idea, of course, is that once you enter into it, there are several obligations that need to be fulfilled before the money transaction actually happens. 
And so what you would need to do is make sure that there is like an indefinite repeat of these transactions or these conditions so that the payment happens over and over again, where in fact, once the conditions are satisfied and the payment has been made, the smart contract ends. Could that be exploited? I'm pretty sure there must be someone on in the world that can do that. Will that be a regular event? Probably not, because as with everything, payroll is, and especially payments, are very regulated. So when you run payroll, you already know upfront what your payroll will look like from a financial point of view. And businesses actually plan for all these types of expenditures, right? Especially because payroll is such a large sum of money. Now with these payroll con or with these smart contracts it will probably be smaller amounts of money, but there's still a financial department somewhere in your business that is keeping track on financial payments. And so someone will notice it shortly after it starts to happen that you keep paying the same person the same amount over and over again. That might be too late in that specific situation, but I don't believe that it will be able to happen indefinitely. And also, I don't think the amounts on the smart contracts will be anywhere near the 55 million of the Ethereum. <laughs> So that's a very fair point. Otherwise, I'm in the wrong job. So just to clear something up, I should have mentioned this in my introduction to the question. But for those not familiar with what a smart contract is, essentially it's a set of promises written out in code, which works by using statements like, if this, then that. So once set in motion, it's designed to be entirely dependent on its code and it's designed to be reversible. So if there was a smart contract between a company and a contractor, for example, when a certain number of hours of work had been completed, that's the if this, then a smart contract can automatically pay the contractor, which would be the then that. And it does that by deploying the piece of remotely executable code, which is linked to an instruction from either the bank account or to the contractor's bank account and so on. So we wouldn't need to contact our bank on a monthly payment run along with all the payroll processing time that entails. We just deal direct with one another. And with the smart contract, there's a guarantee that the work is completed. So for those not familiar with what smart contracts are, hopefully that's a, a brief example of what it is and how they work. In addition to that as well, I wasn't, my intention with the 55 million pound example wasn't to scaremonger. It was very much for, as Anita, I think it's very articulately done there, is explain that whatever solution we decide to go forward with, I don't want blockchain people to be scared of blockchain, but you're going to hear a lot of these news articles coming out as the technology becomes more into the mainstream. There are risks with all the software that we use, even now. So those that are using ERP software right now, there are still risks. There are still hacking risks and security risks with anything that we deploy. Those stories will always make the mainstream. And blockchain is so mainstream at the moment that any slight example of there being an error or a problem with it, everyone hears about it. You are answered that question brilliantly, Anita. And I think it's a really good way of just telling the industry that, hey, it's coming. And yes, there are risks, but hopefully NGA and other service providers are going to try and minimize that risk as much as possible because ultimately the software is going to help improve efficiency and improve the way that we do things. We're just going to go for a quick advert break. When we come back, we're going to find out all about the advantages and disadvantages of both blockchain and cryptocurrencies. So back right after this. Einstein famously said that insanity was doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. We believe it's time to try a new approach to recruitment. JGA Recruitment specialise in recruiting the top 15% of payroll and HR talent using innovative 24-7 attraction strategies that are proven to improve quality of hire, candidate retention and return on investment. De-risk your recruitment process today and hire better talent faster with JGA Recruitment. Visit jgarecruitment.com to find out more. Now, one of the big advantages of blockchain is speed, and it's incredibly fast. I'll let Anise talk about that in a little bit more detail, but there is a cost of the speed, and the cost can be found in the fact that blockchain transactions tend to use up considerable energy consumption and computing power because they're verified using very complex algorithms. In addition, as the size of the blockchain grows, which is obviously every time there's a transaction, it grows and grows and grows. The requirements for storage, bandwidth, and computing power is obviously going to increase. So, Anita, do you see scalability as being a potential barrier to blockchain implementation in the long term? 
It's an interesting question because on the one hand side, you have a technology that can help you establish trust and transparency. And on the other hand side, because of this trust and, tra and transparency, there is a lot of energy consumption, which is a concern, obviously. Now, if you look at the public blockchain, remember that I said earlier that anyone can be a user or run a node. And that means the more nodes that exist, the more computers, the larger the network becomes, and the more computers those new transactions need to be replicated to. And that is one of the major reasons behind this energy consumption. When you are looking at permission blockchain, you can control the number of nodes in the infrastructure. Therefore, the energy consumption is much lower. Energy consumption is a concern, but it all depends on the application. And I also know that within the industry, there's a lot of focus on thinking up smart ways to reduce these energy needs. Sure. So by the time potentially we see blockchain in the mainstream, you would hope there's going to be significant innovation and advancements in the way that energy consumption is, is used. Yeah. Okay. So last question, really, in terms of blockchain technology, uh, there's a couple of other questions I wanted to ask before we finish, but how do you see the blockchain technology roadmap evolving in relation to payroll over the coming months or years? You've mentioned you think it's going to be coming into the market, certainly in the next two years. How do you see that roadmap evolving? What will happen is that many companies like ours are experimenting with use cases and are starting to understand what works and what doesn't, where blockchain adds value and where it doesn't, and sorting through the hype, as you will. So bringing blockchain back from blockchain will be the cure-all and bring us world peace to, okay, this is a really smart application of blockchain, and this will greatly benefit employees as well as employers. These educational certificates and diplomas are a really good example because once you put those on the blockchain, the information is there, it's secure, it's encrypted, and no one can tamper with it. It's almost a guarantee to the employee that, yes, they completed that study, and to the employer that, yes, this person actually went through this institute and got a diploma. Those types of cases it almost becomes a straightforward application and, you know, almost like, why didn't we think about this before? The same will happen in payroll. And you could, you could imagine, for instance, that as an employee, you start to work for a company and you give that company access to your um, personal data to run payroll with, and you withdraw that permission the moment that you exit the business. So you are absolutely sure that your information doesn't stay in longer in the systems of that employer than necessary for them to pay you. Now, there's also always some legislation involved with that, right? Because as an employee, you cannot completely withdraw your personal data from an employer's record for legislative purposes. But still, it's... You know, it gives you more control over what someone does and not only your employer, but what with your data. So I think that we are only scratching the service, but also that we are coming to a point in the next two years where we understand where it's extremely useful and where we just should bother. And are there any particular blockchain innovations that you're involved in right now that NGA are, are fully involved with testing that you're able to, to share? Yes, um, we are fully involved in testing and we will start to publish about that a little bit later in the year. So here I'm going to um, ask for your patience and I hope for your curiosity. Sure, that's fantastic. Well, um, I'll add a link in the episode notes to yourself, you need to, on the NJ site so people can follow or read the articles you've already delivered on blockchain, but also follow on, on your news as it comes through as well. Now, I have to ask this question because for me, there is an elephant in the room. And before I started my research into blockchain, which takes a little bit to get your head around, you know, I thought it was all about Bitcoin. 
I thought it was all about cryptocurrency and everyone's talking about Bitcoin and the money people have made and the, all the different bits that go with it. And we haven't really spoken about cryptocurrency yet. And I think it's important that we, we haven't actually, because I think it's good that we separate blockchain from Bitcoin because cryptocurrencies have a very little to do with the benefits of blockchain applications, which hopefully the listeners have got a feel for that during this podcast. However, there is a lot of hype around cryptocurrencies right now. And so it would appear to be a natural evolution of the workplace that businesses should start potentially paying their employees in cryptocurrencies in the future, right? So already I know some companies are involved in doing this already. They are predominantly companies already with me in the fintech space. But an example would be Japan's GMO Internet, which announced in February that they would allow workers to take home up to $890 a month in Bitcoin. However, Cryptocurrency is also extremely volatile for those that follow the markets. And it's not unknown for the price of Bitcoin, Ethereum, or any of the other better known crypto coins to increase or decrease by 10 or even 20% in value in a single day. So with these things in mind, do you think there will ever be a wide scale company adoption of the idea of payrolling its employees in cryptocurrency? Yeah, and I think that all has to do with our acceptance of cryptocurrency. This is not so much about payroll. And until cryptocurrencies are stabilized, like you put it very well, they're extremely volatile. And so can lose 10 or 20% of their value one day to the next. Where as you are being paid, you know, in pounds or euros or dollars, you're relatively sure that what you buy today, you can buy tomorrow, considering inflation is not running at an all-time high. So the reasons why we want to, want to be paid in euros is also, or in dollars or pounds, is also because when we go to a, to a shop or when we go to the internet, other people trust us to pay them in that currency. It's not enormously costly for us to do so. So this whole infrastructure relies on the currencies that are currently in use. As soon as the mainstream starts to trust cryptocurrency or a specific cryptocurrency, I think it's very feasible. We are getting paid in that cryptocurrency provided it's not so volatile and provided everyone else accepts it. Correct. Yeah. As long as that isn't the case, why would I be paid in cryptocurrency instead of, you know, a stable currency that I'm used to? Ultimately, we will see one or two cryptocurrencies or, you know, a handful of cryptocurrencies that are becoming mainstream, but it will take a while. It's still too much hype. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And interestingly, for those that are considering investing, obviously, but well, if you decide to do in Bitcoin, uh, be aware that there are additional tax implications as well for being paid in Bitcoin or, or any cryptocurrency, especially if, as the employee, you convert the Bitcoin back to sterling. Now, the HM Revenue Customs have already warned that traders, investors and holders may have to pay capital gains tax on any profits made. Just in making that statement themselves, it would suggest that HMRC are starting to take cryptocurrency more seriously, which is interesting. But like you mentioned, why would employers want to pay employers in cryptocurrency when at present we already have a very stable mainstream currency? For here, us here, it's the good old English pound. It already does the job well enough. It can be spent much easier on the open market. Well, what's your view on the... Um, HMRC sort of making statements on cryptocurrencies now and talking about capital gains taxes or tax implications if you decide to go in Bitcoin. Do you have any views on, on HMRC starting to take it more seriously? Well, not on the HMRC specifically, but on regulators in general. Two years ago, they just wouldn't touch it. There's an interesting development in that regulators are starting to look at cryptocurrencies and getting more involved, creating opinions, and uh, like what you just mentioned, bringing out warnings or, or updates about what people who hold them should do with them. You also see a number of financial institutions starting to look at investing in cryptocurrencies. And so you see the whole, I would almost say, establishment starting to understand that, yes, this is something that they need to get engaged in 
because otherwise this will be a development that runs away from them and that people will actually want to use because it offers them an easier way to move money across the world. I can imagine that regulators want to understand how that money flows across the world and what they need to do to, you know, for instance, protect people from laundering money through these types of currencies. It will come. Right now, I think people want to get paid in cryptocurrencies because they think that the value of these cryptocurrencies will rise astronomically. So it's more of an investment vehicle than a payment vehicle. In fact, you know, when Bitcoin dropped in value, some of the transactions cost more than the intrinsic value of the transaction. Wow. Yeah, that's also something to be aware of. So I don't think that running around with your crypto coin wallet and, you know, paying for a, for a full tank of gas is one of the applications that we will all be doing next year. It will become more mainstream. And as it becomes more mainstream, it's logical that regulators become involved. And actually, the fact that they do become involved will probably be a signal to, to many people that, okay, now it becomes more mainstream because it will become regulated. That's a great point. And you mentioned the international uh, or cross-border payments as well. Um, it appears to me that the, the companies that are really going to benefit from blockchain-based payroll are those probably with an international workforce, at least part of which is, is based remotely because blockchain promises faster cross-border payments, less expensive cross-border payments, less error-prone. So it does kind of solve one of the biggest costs involved in payroll. So I'm sure that's something MGA are, are looking at as well, because fewer errors and faster payments means fewer disputes between a company and its workers. For companies of international workers applying themselves to projects all across the globe, it kind of seems that blockchain-based payroll systems could work really well. Absolutely. And I think that is also an area. So international payments is an area where you see lots of initiatives for you know, blockchain applications. And also, these are some companies that are actively using this to speed up the transaction against less cost. So there's also a really good business case to move to blockchain when it comes to transferring money across borders. Sure. And I know you've got some of that in your in your blogs as well. So I won't give the whole game away. If people want to read more, please do go to uh, Anita's blog page, which again, I'll put the, the link in the episode notes. So Last question before we enter the final part of this podcast, which is the ironically called the vault and the crypto vault. If you're a power manager right now, how do you think they should be getting to grips with this technology? I would advise them to either watch a video on YouTube or, you know, read some blogs, my blogs preferably, but do, do a little bit of research because you need to understand where this is headed. And even if it doesn't mean that your full process will be running on a blockchain, if you're using an external provider for some parts of it, you will probably see blockchain start to pop up in their service offerings. And that means that you need to understand what they are doing. Now, obviously, you can also ask your, you know, your external provider to give you a little bit of a, of an update or a presentation on how they apply it, the use cases that they are experimenting with. But yes, you need to understand where this is headed. Don't go as far as, you know, diving deep into the technology because it is complex and you need to have a really good grasp of technology to be able to fully comprehend it. There are more than enough blockchain 101s out there to get you comfortable with at least the basic principles. Sure. I've already mentioned to your uh, blog, Anita, but we also at James Square Associates are going to be releasing a series of articles to try and understand and demystify what it's all about to follow up this podcast as well. So please do keep an eye out for our own blogs because there'll be a number of different chapters all about blockchain, payroll companies, remittances and payments, benefits, all those kind of things. And we'll, we'll release them as a series of probably 10 articles, which we've already started to write. So keep an eye out for those. And thanks ever so much for answering all of those quite deep technical questions. I think you've handled them brilliantly and you've given a really good account of 
how blockchain is going to impact the industry and of course for us to prepare for it because we're talking about the future of payroll right now and it's important that everyone embraces what is coming as early as possible so that we can prepare for it. So just to finish off the podcast, we're going to enter the vault. Entering the vault. One piece of advice you would give to someone working in payroll right now. Do pay attention to what is happening in the industry, especially around new technology innovations, not only about blockchain, but also about artificial intelligence, AI, chatbots, because it's going a lot faster than most of us think. Great answer. And the AI and chatbots is certainly a subject that we intend to tackle on a payroll podcast for the future episode. So uh, a brilliant point well made. With the benefit of hindsight, Anita, what would be the one career decision you would change? I probably wouldn't change a career decision, but I might change my field of study. I was thinking about the question. Yeah, because I have a master's in arts, but I think I would study technology and engineering if I would do it all over again. When you studied art, was there a particular um, genre of art or type of art that you studied? So I studied language and literature. And I have an ed- educational degree, so that's completely different from what I'm doing now. Sure, sure. So if you had the power of foresight and you could change the entire payroll industry with one action or improvement, what would that action or improvement be? I would eliminate all local laws. Okay. Payroll would be so much easier if there were regional or global laws that everyone had to abide with, as opposed to all the the nitty gritty local laws that everyone needs to remember and put into their payroll processing, everyone would greatly benefit if we could could eliminate the local laws. Fantastic answer. I agree, of course. And um, I think one thing we've established during the series of these payroll podcasts is just how complex payroll is and can be and you know, the job that the power managers and the power professionals listening to this podcast have to deal with every day, particularly uh, when you start talking about global and regional payrolls. Who motivates you and why? I am mostly motivated by our clients, by talking to our clients because you know they bring me new problems, they bring me new ideas. And then by my colleagues from, from NGA, just because whatever you throw at them in these types of, you know, problems or client questions, they always come up with an answer. So it's not just the one person, but it's a whole set of people that I work with that completely fascinate me on a daily basis. Brilliant. And if you didn't work in payroll, what would you be doing? I would travel the world. Fabulous. I just want to finish this Power Podcast again by saying a massive thank you, Anita, for joining us on what is, to my mind, a very complex subject that I think you've been able to articulate very, very well. So thank you so much. You're welcome. It was a pleasure, Nick. If you want to find out more about NGAHR, then please do go to ngahr.com. There's a wealth of information on the website. There's a blog you can visit uh, where you can find Anita's articles. There's a wealth of information. If you haven't visited ngahr.com, I highly recommend that you do. Fantastic. Listen, thank you ever so much for listening. Um, I'm Nick Day from James Gray Associates. This is the Payroll Podcast, and I will be speaking to you all again in a couple of weeks. You've been listening to the Payroll Podcast with Nick Day of JGA Recruitment, specialist payroll recruiters. If you would like to feature on a future podcast, please contact us. For a wealth of world-class payroll content, please visit us at jgarecruitment.com. See you next week.